So for any of you that are watching this via video, and uh, you're just sort of showing up and turning on this sermon, and you see Eric. Eric looks a little funny right now. Uh, Eric, uh, his face looks like he's been doing some crying, and I have. Uh, my mom passed away on Friday, and I just read a tribute to her, and for good reason, I shed some tears, and they were good tears. And so uh, just to explain that uh, for anyone who might uh, be looking in that isn't here present right now. Uh, this is a special weekend in so many regards. We had our uh, one group, our five-week students, uh, graduate on Friday, and then we had uh, we have we have I should say our alumni arriving in town uh, today, and we start our alumni summit tonight. This is a very fun time for us as leaders. Uh, it's very very special seeing. The alumni step into town. Of course, I'm looking out into the audience and there are certain ones I'm already noticing are here and it's very, very special to see you guys. Uh, but so what we're doing this week is fun in multiple regard, regards, not just having alumni here, but we are doing sort of a retro Ellerslie where we are going back and picking some of our old classics from like year one of Ellerslie, like some of the ones, like the messages that we were most known for back then, like people fell in love with Ellerslie in this time because of some of these messages, and they're not part of our training, strangely. And so Philip went through and he picked out some just doozies, uh, that's what we used to call them too, we still do uh, use that term, but they are doozies. And uh, so bonus doozy, this is a retro sermon. I am going back 12 years almost to the day, and I'm bringing up a, one that wasn't even in uh, Philip's list because this wasn't in first year. It was like second year Ellerslie. And so I figured, you know what? It's, it, it's a retro sermon. I can still go back 12 years. It's so still a long time, guys. And this is just a fun sermon, and I think you guys will really enjoy it. If any of you remember it, that shows that you have listened to a lot of sermons over the years. The Coronation of Napoleon. Uh, isn't that a great cover uh, slide? Uh, well done, Annie. That is wonderful. So this was originally given August 8th, 2011. That's a long time ago. How old am I? Of course, I'm looking out there and I'm seeing Josh Kinnebrew. I'm saying, how old is Josh Kinnebrew? Uh, <laughs> Six Secrets of Christian Celebrityism. The recipe for rising to the top of the heap. So if I was going to encourage you to rise to the top of the heap and make your name known and just do this right, there's a certain recipe for it. Of course, uh, just on the side, that's not actually what I'm going to try and teach you to do in life. But if I was going to teach you to do that, this is a great recipe for your success. Now, I am going to contrast the recipe that Napoleon is going to use for his success, I'm going to contrast that with the recipe Jesus uses for his success, just as a you know, foreshadow of where we're going. But first, I'm going to start with the way the world works today. And ironically, this has crept into Christianity, which has really uh, caused us to lose sight of the way we ought to behave as believers. So here's our six secrets Secret number one, self-exaltation. Celebrityism, a bigger-than-life montage of one's hip, cool, smart, sexy, and talented attributes. The world says big image is what brings about big influence. So the world wants to bait you to make it about your image. And that's exactly what self-exaltation is based around. And if you want to be successful, says the world, and even ironically much of the Christian world, then you need to build an image of yourself. Secret number two, self-effort. The world applauds the hard working of making it, the hard work of making it, of applying all that, so that self-effort can bring and then tirelessly laboring until the opportune moment of fame and influence arrives. Secret number three, self-marketing. Claim the seat of the important. Declare to the world that you are the next big thing. Let them be impressed with you. And for that to happen, you must first be impressed with yourself. Get your face up on the billboards, in front of the cameras, in the papers, on the covers of the magazines. The world must know you in order to be influenced by you. Some of you, you have to admit this sounds like wisdom because this is the system we have grown up in. Secret number four, self-promotion. 
Don't miss an opportunity to plug your product, which is you. Don't overlook an opportunity to grab the spotlight and, spotlight and make clear why your product, you, is better than the competition, why your message is significant for this hour, and why you are the one to rescue the church from its lethargy. Secret number five, self-pampering. You are needed in this desperate hour, and therefore you must be well-fed and well-rested. Take care of yourself as your primary code of behavior, for if you aren't pampered, and if you aren't massaged by the hands of praise and adulation daily, you may lose your edge and thusly your influence. Secret number six, self-solution. If you find a dilly, then don't dilly-dally. Don't let any moss grow on your situation. Always press for forward movement. Always seek to keep the wheels moving on your career, your interests, the gaining of your pursuits, and the fostering of your personal benefit. If you find a Hagar, take advantage of her. So, guys, if you know me, you know that that is the exact opposite of everything I teach and everything I live. However, it's good to sometimes lay it out there and just let us freshly ruminate on the way the world thinks. And when the world's thinking enters into the church, weird things happen. Genesis 17, 18, this is Abraham. And Abraham has promised, I'm sorry, God has promised Abraham a son. And Abraham is a little tired of waiting. So he is going to take it into his own hands. And that was the final one, the self-solution. And whenever you go about to find a solution in self-sibility, it really messes up the whole scenario. And that's where Ishmael comes from. Ishmael is Abraham's self-effort, his attempt at meeting God's promise, his attempt at doing what only God can do. And we have a tendency to do the same, and we produce an Ishmael. It's funny, the description of Ishmael in Scripture is that he was a wild donkey of a man. It's like we are very capable of producing wild donkey solutions in our own life. And listen to Abraham's plea. And it's the same plea in our souls. Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Oh, that my own self-effort would be sufficient, that it would be enough. And yet that isn't how Christianity works. So I call this the doctrine of modern American Christianity. I must increase that Christ would increase. Now, if you know your scripture, you're going to know that the exact opposite is true, but this sounds really true to the ears, especially of an American. If I increase, if my image increases, if people would see me, then Christ would be seen because I would take my platform and I would say something like, I just want to thank Jesus Christ. That's what I could do with it. And so I could get all the benefits of you know, celebrity. I could get all the, the money that comes with celebrity. And then I could give 10% to the church. I mean, what a blessing for God. And this is a mentality that can easily creep into our thinking. So here's a, a best-selling author of our day, maybe a previous day, but a best-selling author. And this is, now I'm not actually trying to throw John Eldridge under the bus, nice man. However, his mentality is actually a little off, and that is that he believes that the secret is not to die to self, it's to die to your false self, so that your true self can live. And that's just psychology 101. That's actually what Dr. Phil teaches too. What we need is what the Bible teaches. And so here's just some quotes from the best-selling author uh, of our past generation. Living for your glory is the only loving thing to do. Let people feel the weight of who you are and let them deal with it. Take the throne, be what he meant you to be. Now, I'm just going to say that actually isn't how it works. Now, John Eldridge has a lot of great stuff to say. You read the front half of Wild at Heart and you're going to be like charged. His solution is what's off because his solution is you need to die to your false self or your father wound so that your true self can live. And I'm just going to be straightforward and blunt. You need to die to yourself. I don't care, false self, true self, it doesn't matter who it is. Self needs to be denied so that Christ could live. The secret to Christianity isn't you being all you can be, it's Christ being what he intends to be in and through you, and that's how you become what you're supposed to be. So the dangers of self-exalting Christian leadership. John 3.30, so this is the exact opposite of what we are going to hear from our modern day, and that is he, or Jesus, must increase, and this is John the Baptist speaking, but I must decrease. See, John the Baptist is a picture of the, the friend of the bridegroom. So, and that's actually what he's even gonna call himself. And the friend of the bridegroom is entrusted with a job, and that is to lead the bride to the groom. 
Well, that is the picture of what we are as the church. We are not meant to draw people to ourselves. If you're ever a leader in the church, your goal is not to draw people to yourself. You're a friend of the bridegroom. Your job is to lead them to Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. John 5.30, I can of my own self do nothing. That's very different. I mean, if you're acknowledging things like that, you're on the opposite end of the spectrum here. You're basically saying this, this thing known as Eric Ludi, is unable to fulfill the task. I can't do it. There's only one that can do it. His name is Jesus. For this life to be effective, I need a helper. I need a savior. I need a deliverer. I need one to move into this as a house and live through it. That is the great secret of what makes Christianity work. The coronation of Napoleon, the pomp and circumstance of self-crowning arrogance. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the coronation of Napoleon or how he was crowned emperor. He didn't want to be called a king because a king was lowly. He wanted a new title. He wanted to be emperor. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard this story, but it's, it's rather shocking <laughs> to the point where you're just like speechless. It's like, are you serious? So here's a, a famous painting back in 1804, uh, and you really can't see what's going on there. But if you look closely, you're going to see Napoleon. He's standing right there, and he has a crown in his hand. Okay, that'll make more sense as we progress. And so, oh, well, there are, I have my own little cheat uh, circle of it. I didn't even need to go through all that description. So Napoleon in 1804 is going to be quoted as saying, to be a king is to inherit old ideas and genealogy. I don't want to descend from anyone. The title of emperor is greater. Okay, guys, I don't know if you're picking up on it, but I think we have a little pride uh, that has crept in. Okay, maybe not a little, a lot. I don't know that I've ever seen in history a more arrogant man as Napoleon. Okay, by the way, this guy is five foot two. He may have had the, the short guy syndrome. I'm not exactly sure what's going on with him, but he is not a very pleasant guy to be around. He's all about himself. He's always talking about himself. Now, I am going to say, even though you may not want to hear this, is that you have a Napoleon inside of you. Uh-oh. And uh, he's a little rascal that's roaming around inside of you and looking for a little attention as well. And uh, so as we go through this, don't just cluck your tongue at Napoleon, five foot two Napoleon from 1804. You just want to be recognizing what is going on inside of you so you can properly deal with it. So the pageantry of Napoleon, Sunday, December 2nd, 1804. This is quite the day. And the detail with which we know what happened that day is surprising. I mean, I'm just giving you a thumbnail sketch of it. The amount of writing that has gone on about this in the French culture, they know every single detail about what happened that day. So Napoleon woke at 8 a.m. To the sound of a cannonade, he left the Tuileries at 11 a.m. in a white velvet vest with gold embroidery and diamond buttons, crimson velvet tunic and a short crimson coat with satin lining. He wore a wreath of laurel. The number of onlookers, as estimated by Wary, was between four and 5,000, many of whom had held their places all night through intermittent showers that cleared in the morning. Napoleon's carriage was drawn by eight bay horses. An unmanned balloon ablaze with 3,000 lights and an imperial crown pattern was launched from the front of Notre Dame during the celebration. Before entering the Notre Dame Cathedral, Napoleon was vested in a long white satin tunic embroidered in gold thread. During the coronation, he was formally clothed in a heavy coronation mantle made from crimson velvet lined with ermine. The velvet was covered with embroidered golden bees drawn from the golden bees among the regalia that had been discovered in the Morovigian, uh, Morovigian uh, tomb of Shilderic, uh, Shilderi, uh, boy, I've had a tough time. I actually went to try and figure out pronunciation of that one. It looks like Child Eric, so I was feeling sort of honored. It's like, oh, you know what? This is special. But Shilderi, I think, is uh, how it's pronounced. But those of you that speak French are like, oh, excuse me, that was really off. Uh, but Shilderi, the first, a symbol that overleapt and outgloried even Charlemagne. The mantle weighed at least 80 pounds and was supported by four dignitaries. The coronation proper began with the singing of the hymn Vine, Vini Creator Spiritus, followed by the versicle, Lord, send forth your spirit in response and renew the face of the earth and the collect for the feast of Pentecost, God who has taught the hearts of your faithful by sending them light of the light of your Holy Spirit. After this, the prayer, almighty everlasting God, the creator of all, during the litany of the saints, the emperor remained seated, only kneeling for special petitions. The emperor was anointed on his head and on both hands with chrism during the prayer, God, the son of God. 
Because the traditional royal crown had been destroyed during the French Revolution, the so-called crown of Napoleon, made to look medieval and called the crown of Charlemagne for the occasion, was waiting on the altar. Okay, guys, brace yourselves for what's about to happen here. At the moment of the crowning, this is what a coronation is. It's when the king or the emperor, in this case, is going to receive the crown. So the, the tradition is the pope is going to rise up and, and put the crown on the head of the king. And that is a symbol that he has submitted to the church. Listen to what's going to happen here, guys. At the moment of the crowning, Napoleon unexpectedly turned and forestalling the pope, crowned himself. You blow what? That's what he did, guys. Here we have a picture of it. Uh, this is a famous moment in history. I mean, it's so shocking to everyone that he would literally show such disregard to the church leadership, to the pope. Uh, I mean, for most of us, that isn't, you know, we don't understand the gravity of that. But that's a significant statement. The way a real king is made. So we're going to do a contrast, guys, because I don't know how many of you are impressed with Napoleon. I'm just going to say this isn't the way you do it, guys. You may be itching for a crown. This isn't how you get your crown. It's interesting. The kingdom of heaven, there are crowns. And we know that Jesus has crowns, many crowns upon his head. But that the saints of God actually receive crowns too. But how do you get this crown? What is the pathway that Jesus is going to receive his many crowns? So I'm going to call this a study in the coronation of Jesus Christ. So if we looked at Philippians 2, 3 through 11, which you guys are very familiar with, and we broke it down, you can see this pattern. Though God, he made himself of no reputation. Though God, he took upon himself the form of a servant. Though God, he made himself in the likeness of men. Though God, he humbled himself. Though God, he became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And as a result of that... God has highly exalted him and given him the preeminence, the position above all other positions, preeminence, great word, following the leaders. So who is our model? Are, are we going to follow Napoleon or are we going to follow Jesus? Key question in our life. 1 Peter 2.21, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. So it doesn't say anything about following Napoleon, guys. I don't know. You can't dig that up in Scripture. It's not there. We're supposed to follow Jesus. We're supposed to walk in his steps. Well, what are his steps? Gulp. What, 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 what pathway did Jesus walk in his coronation? It's like we know all the details about what's going to happen the day that Napoleon died. I'm sorry, did I just say it that way? Uh, the day that Napoleon died? No, that isn't what I meant. The day that Napoleon was crowned? But we also know a lot of detail about the day that Jesus was crowned. <laughs> of course, that died would make more sense in that context. Preeminence is gained in the lowest place. Now, that's a game changer, guys. If you grasp what I'm saying right there, I mean, that will change your life. That we are after something. We're, we're built for it. We're, we, we have a desire to matter. We have a desire to to influence, to be significant. It's a strange thing that's in our wiring, and that is because God put it there. But when we take that into our own hands and we self-exalt, we self-promote, and we pull a Napoleon, it actually destroys our life. But when we yield whatever that is, that desire to have our life matter, and we say, but Lord, I give that to you. I lay it down before you. Then he can make our life matter. Preeminence is gained in the lowest place. Luke 18, 14, everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Proverbs 25, 6 through 7, do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of the great, for it is better that he say to you, come up here, than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. Jesus is going to go out of his way to make it clear. When you walk into any room, look for the low seat. If you're at a banquet table, take the low seat so that you can be called up higher. How shameful is it to take the high seat and be told to go lower? You see, we are called to enter every room and look for the lowest position. And when we do, that is what God can work with. That's the raw materials that enables him to elevate our life. Five royal steps to the throne. This is profound, guys. How is Jesus going to approach his throne? His day of coronation, what does it look like? It looks very different than Napoleon's. 
It's going to start with step one, Gethsemane, a low place of soul anguish, aloneness, crushing burden, the breaking of heart, the breaking of a man. Step two, the nine tails of torture. Remember the cat of nine tails? That's what they're going to scourge him with, the Roman soldiers are. It's the low place of physical suffering, pain, physical and mental torment, the tearing of the body, the spilling of the blood, the renting of the flesh. Step number three, the walk of the criminal, the low place of false accusation and abuse. A cross is placed upon his shoulders and he needs to walk the distance all the way up to this place called Calvary to Golgotha, the place of the skull. And he, the reason that this pathway is even lined, is lined with mockers and jeers, people that would be able to hurl insults. And so it's a public shame is what this journey is. And so whereas Napoleon gets to walk with pomp and circumstance, Jesus is walking the walk of a criminal. And it's a low place of false accusation and abuse where he's numbered with the criminals. Oh, he's one of them associated with the filthy, misunderstood by the onlooking crowds, weighted down by the heavy cross of other men's sin. Step four, the nails of spectacle, the low place of public ridicule. The reason crucifixion was even used in a public fashion on a, on a hill was to make a declaration to everyone that would see what happens to those that behave this way. And if you follow what this man did, this is the treatment you'll receive. So just think about what this is like for all of us as believers. Looking at our king, our savior, our commander, our leader, and basically the message of the culture is, you do, you follow what this man uh, is leading you towards, you follow in his steps, this is what you get. Isn't it an amazing thought that we're following? <laughs> I mean, do we not realize what we're following? Do we not get it? Do we not understand that this is not the easy way? This isn't the way of Napoleon? So it's pressed to the splintery wood of shame and mockery, absorbing the basest accusations with silence, held in contempt and publicly mocked by the most despicable of men. Step number five, the spear that opens the belly, the low place of death. Even the shameful death of a criminal, the pouring out of all that is within, the giving up of everything for the sake of others. So Jesus, before he dies, is going to make a statement at the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, and he's basically going to say that those that believe on me, out of their belly or their innermost man or their heart will flow rivers of living water. And he's speaking of the Holy Spirit, that there is going to be a work of grace inside of those of us that believe in him as a Messiah that will fill up our inside with something, this living water, this life water. Now look at Jesus on the cross. When, he is, when he, that spear pierces his side, what's going to gush out? It says blood and water. But blood to the Jew is life. That's the life of something. So that's life and water. That's living water. And it's going to gush out of his heart, his innermost man. And he's saying this is the same thing that we receive. Those that follow Jesus receive the same treatment. Jesus bravely walked the red carpet of crucifixion, the royal path of heavenly coronation, strewn with happy petals of righteous suffering and the joyous trumpet sounds of soul anguish. His pain was the chrism, his wounds the ermine robe, the thorns of mockery his crown, the nails of earthly trial his cannonade and benediction, and the spear in his side the standing ovation of the heavenly host. There's your king of kings. There's your lord of lords. His path is very different than the path of this earth. Whereas if we were going to decide how we, if we were God, would come to this earth, would not have our arrival announced to shepherds. You've got to be kidding. Uh, did someone mess up the script here? Because uh, we're singing to shepherds right now, announcing the arrival of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Shepherds? That's the lowest people. The most despised people of the entire culture is who the arrival of Jesus is announced to. Whoa, whoa, stop, 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 stop. Okay, something's gone wrong in this production. We're trying to showcase the glory of God. And we're, we're in a, a little town called Bethlehem. We have no room. We're outdoors somewhere. It doesn't say a stable, but we're just presuming because there seems to be some barnyard effects like he's laid in a manger, right, which is a feeding trough for animals. And so, whoa, whoa, whoa. What, why is our king being laid in a feeding trough? Why is he being announced to shepherds? 
Uh, someone's missing it here, guys. This isn't how it works. Or is it? You see, this isn't how it works down here, but it is how it works in heaven. You see, in heaven, they have a native language, a native tongue to heaven. And some of people argue about what we'll speak in heaven. It's like certain people are convinced it's going to be English, right? It's like, oh, it has to be English. And some people are like the Jews, especially, like, it'll be Hebrew. It'll be Hebrew, God's language. And here, I'm going to solve all of that by just telling you what they're going to speak in heaven. Aren't you guys interested? The language of humility. The language of humility is what God speaks in heaven. And only those that speak the same language enter heaven. That we have to adopt this native tongue of heaven because it doesn't match our thinking. When we look at Jesus and we look at how he chose to live out his strength, he's God, and yet he's going to do that? It doesn't make sense to our rationale, but that's because we don't think like heaven. And so it is supposed to show us that heaven is other than us. That's what the word holy even means, otherly. It is not like us. God is not like us, but he wants to make us like him. The six baffling secrets of Jesus' coronation. Guys, this is quite something. You know how uh, if I, I went through the recipe for sort of making a name for yourself in the Christian world today? So we're going to contrast those. D Jesus did not gain preeminence through self-exaltation. Instead, he did it through purposeful smallness. That's a very bad marketing campaign. Purposeful smallness? Could you imagine you would write a marketing book called Purposeful Smallness? You know, don't let anyone know about what you're doing. If you heal someone, tell them not to speak about it. It's like, what do you want? No, 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 no. Broadcast this. Let's make a stink about this. Let's make you known. Instead, he's doing the exact opposite. What? Jesus did not gain preeminence through self-effort, but through total consecration. Jesus did not gain preeminence through self-marketing, but through the unqualified acceptance of the Father's terms. It had nothing to do with him. He wasn't after his own glory. He was after the Father's glory. Jesus did not gain preeminence through self-promotion, but through silence. Jesus did not gain preeminence through self-pampering, but through suffering. Jesus did not gain preeminence through self-solution, but through waiting. The lost corridor of greatness. I'm going to call it the path of shame and spitting. So you can look at all the options you have for your life, and there's one over here, you know, this path of shame and spitting that we just sort of don't see. We glaze over you know, if you look, read Pilgrim's Progress and you have, you know, Christian uh, gets up to the uh, mountain of difficulty and it goes straight up. And then you have a nice wide road that goes to the left and a nice wide road that goes to the right. Uh, I would prefer the broad way than the narrow way. That's why it says about the narrow way, fewer those who find it. Fewer those who find the lost corridor of greatness because it's a path of shame and spitting. Well, I'm not attracted to that, I understand. Neither is the natural man of Eric. You see, all of us are naturally repulsed by the pathway of Jesus. But when we come to Jesus and we humble ourselves and the Spirit of God works in us, he begins to convince us of the brilliance of this path. Isaiah 50, two through three and then verse six. At my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a wilderness. I clothe the heavens with blackness and I make sackcloth their covering. So this is a pretty big God we're dealing with, right? And yet look, three short verses later after making these statements of having total control over all the elements, he says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair and I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Who is this? This one who has laid down his life for us. King of kings, Lord of lords, God himself is going to come and allow that treatment. That is the most humiliating and derogatory treatment at this culture, in this culture. To have your beard ripped out was the highest shame. There were two, two things. Remember those one guys that had their, uh, their backside of their pants ripped off and their beards uh, plucked out? That is the highest level of shame. Jesus is literally going to come and he's going to hang naked and he's going to have his beard ripped out, and he's going to be spat upon. He's going to have a mocking crown pressed upon his head. It's a crown of thorns. 
They're mocking him, guys. They're not like trying to treat him as royalty just in a weird way. They're mocking him. He is true royalty. Napoleon is nothing. And yet he's, with his pomp and circumstance, acting like he's all that. Jesus is something, someone. And yet he's willing to give all of that up because he is doing something far greater. He's not after the agenda of Napoleon, which is self-exaltation. He's interested in rescuing you. And in so doing, he is going to take the lowest place. And this is actually his coronation. God is going to highly exalt him. Charles Spurgeon says this about uh, Isaiah 50. He says, what a descent from the omnipotence which veils the heavens with clouds to the gracious condescension which does not veil its own face but permits it to be spat upon. The spittle smeared cheek of the Almighty. A bewildering meditation of highness become lowness. So guys, this is just one of those precious meditations that just needs to be whipped out, uh, I guess, once every 12 years, right? This is a very, very precious thing. When I go back to this message, this is my favorite part. Because it's just going through the scripture, and I'm going to show you how high and lofty he is. And then I'm in the midst of it, I'm going to contrast it with how low he's willing to become. And it is so startling that the two are one God. That he who is all that is going to give up all that. That here we, who aren't all that, can't even give up what, we're, what isn't that impressive. We're holding on to it. And we're like little five foot two varmints that are wrangling for our own exaltation. We want to be noticed. We want to be appreciated. And here is Jesus. And he loves us, even in our five foot two varmint state. And he wants to enter into our world to rescue us. My God has measured the waters of this earth in the hollow of his hand, meddied out heaven with a span, comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. To him, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not." When he heads off to war, there are none that can stay his hand. He sits as king between the mighty cherubim, above all, over all, and in control of all, the creator of the heavens and the earth, God of all the kingdoms of this earth. He can bind the sweet influences of Pleiades and loose the bands of Orion. He can set the dominion of his ordinances in the earth. He can send forth lightning, number the clouds, and stay the bottles of heaven. He was a worm and no man a reproach of men and despise of the people. All they that saw him laughed him to scorn. They shot out the lip. They shook their head. That word for worm is actually a scarlet crimson worm, which was known for actually affixing itself to wood and laying its eggs. And then to preserve the life of its eggs, it would give up its life and spread and cover it with a red, the life of its, of its being. So this I mean, it's, it's the cross, guys. I mean, that's basically what it is. And Jesus is going to say, I am that worm that is going to give up my life for my children to live. He is the mighty God, the everlasting God, over all God blessed forever, the God of the whole earth, and his throne is forever and ever. He is the almighty which is and which was and which is to come, the creator of all things, the upholder of all things, the father of eternity, the beginning and the ending, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. They gaped upon him. He was poured out like water and all his bones were out of joint. His heart was like wax. It melted in the midst of his bowels. His strength was dried up like a pot shirt and his tongue cleaved to his jaws. They pierced his hands and his feet. They parted his garments among them and cast lots upon his vesture. He is the rock of ages, the head of every man, the head of all principality and power, Lord of lords, Lord both of the dead and living, Lord of all, Lord over all. He is the prince of princes, the prince of the kings of the earth, he that filleth all in all, the king of kings, the righteous judge, the king of saints, king of nations, king over all the earth, the king of glory, crowned with many crowns, and he sitteth king forever. He made sackcloth his garment, and he was a song of the drunkards. Reproach broke his heart, and he was full of heaviness. They smote the judge of Israel with a rod upon his cheek. 
Before him, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or can say unto him, what doest thou? Before the mountains were brought forth or ever had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, he was God. When the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against him, he shall laugh and shall hold them in derision. He gave his back to the smiters and his cheek to them that plucked off the hair. He did not hide his face from shame and spitting. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. He is bound by nothing but his own nature and his own law. He is not limited in, go- or in power nor governed in action by the will or the pleasure of any angel, demon, or man. But rather, he is limited and governed only by the dictums and restraints of his own loving prerogative to gain for himself a peculiar people, to establish his kingdom in this earth, and to shed abroad his glory unto the heathen. They laughed him to scorn. They spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. In the not-so-distant future... When he will return to bring terrible judgment to nations and his feet shall touch down on Mount Olivet and see it divide asunder, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And all will behold the Ancient of Days whose eyes are as a flame of fire, whose voice is as the sound of many waters and whose countenance is as the sun shining in all its strength. They will see the fiery stream issuing forth from before him, the thousand thousands ministering unto him and the 10,000 times 10,000 that stand before him at the judgment. And all will behold the one at whose feet all crowns will be cast, for he is worthy to receive all glory and honor and power, for he has created all things, and for his pleasure they are and were created. They smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees worshipped him. They that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. So in concert with the noble King David, I pronounce thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. How does one become great in the kingdom of heaven? We know the answer to this. In other words, everything I'm saying is a retro message. It's not like Eric is unveiling some truth that hasn't been shared many times in this very building. And yet, the funny thing about church, I'm sorry, the funniest thing about truth, even though I'm sure it is funny about church too, the funny thing about truth is it's different than just facts. Facts you can learn and still remember 50 years later. No one needs to freshly remind you about the ABCs. No one needs to freshly remind you that two plus two equals four. But in the kingdom of heaven, truth is living. And if it's not exercised, if it's not freshly believed, if it's not freshly reckoned, if it's not freshly gripped, it fades. To the point where I can say a truth and you're like, huh, I know that truth. That doesn't mean you're living it. That doesn't mean you freshly know that truth. And so for us, It is critical for us to freshly remember the highness of our God and the willingness for him to condescend and come low because he's inviting us into the same life. We have an itch and an instinct to be as Napoleon, which is why I have to bring him up. He is such a hyperbolized version of everything that we struggle with. And, you know, but this is exactly what we struggle with. We want to be seen. We want to be appreciated. We want this life to be about us. And God has to silence us and say, I have something so much better for you. What you are esteeming actually leads to death. There is a way that seems right unto man, but it leads to death. And for most of us, if we were to look out there at some of the most famous, most wealthy, most popular people, there is an itch to say, oh, if I could just have what they have. You actually don't want what they have. What was the story about Tim Allen? Back in the day, this is right when Leslie and I were married because I remember he, the, the movie, The Santa Claus came out. And I still remember we were on our anniversary uh, getaway. Uh, not anniversary, we were on our honeymoon. Boy, let's, let's upgrade what I'm saying here. We were, we were on a, our honeymoon getaway and I still remember the poster of it. So that's the time frame. And at this time, Tim Allen had the number one selling book uh, on the bestseller list, New York Times bestseller list. He had the number one television show 
uh, on on television, uh, I can't remember what that was called. Some you know uh, workerman uh, one, and then he had the number one movie in America, which was the Santa Claus. This guy had reached the pinnacle of everything he set out to do, every dream that a guy could have, and he was pondering suicide because he got to the end of the rainbow and there was no pot of gold there. Everything the culture had convinced him was worth selling his soul to get, he came to the end and he was like, it's not there, guys. You could look at Napoleon and just wish that you had that ermine robe with those bees, you know, knit into it, which sounds really weird. Uh, you could have a crown on your head and everyone could bow down before you. Oh, it sounds so attractive, even though I know some of us in here are like, no, I actually am not interested in that. Yes, it's a hyperbolized version of what we're after. But we want an easier life. We want to be applauded. We want to be liked. We want wealth. We want power. We want influence. It's an instinct within us and it's very dangerous. Because if that instinct, if that drive in us isn't consecrated to Jesus, and we don't say, Lord, here is my life. This is your life. This is your passion. This is your desires. This is what you must deny. This is what you must give up. It's called a suke in the Greek. And it is your passion for life and what you would crave. And Jesus says, you must give that to me. That if you do not, and if you hold on to it, you will die. But if you give up that suke, you give up that life, you will find it. What you're after is actually real, but it's not going to be found in this earth and sense. It's found in the kingdom of heaven. Your value and the esteem and the, if you could say it this way, the wealth that you crave is actually a spiritual wealth. But the only way you will ever find it is if you give up this earth. You give up your drive and your ambition, this desire, this, this angst that you have to be something, to make a name for yourself. You say, Lord Jesus, this is for you. And you hand over that suke to him. That's how you do it. And this is the reminder. Like I said, this isn't new. This is just the fresh reminder to freshly believe what Jesus Christ teaches. So how does one become great in the kingdom of heaven? They follow Jesus. And you do know where Jesus goes, right? You do know that he went to Gethsemane, that he went to uh, that cross, so he had the, the scourge of the nine tails, and that he's going to hang on a cross. And Jesus is going to say to us, pick up your cross and follow me. Uh, cross? Now, we, we can try and make cross sound very romantic and beautiful, but that's pick up your execution device and follow me. Pick up that which would slay your previous life so that you can live for me. Whatever is going to put to death this first life, this life of Adam, this life that yearns for self-glory, this Napoleonic life, whatever is causing that to still breathe, pick up the execution device, hang on it. A cross is only as good as it, its finished work. You know, there's nothing quite like a guy still having a hand alive on the cross. It's like, you know, if the cross is going to do its work, it's going to slay the whole man. And the same is true with our old life. We don't want a right hand still flailing about in our old life. You know, a, a left pinky toe, you know, that's still, still quivering. We want the whole thing gone. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. That old stuff has passed away. Behold, all things are new. Eric Ludi is supposed to live new now. And he can look at Gethsemane, he can look at the cross, he can look at the suffering and smile. Because in each of these things, God is bringing out a greater weight of glory. He is doing something wonderful in it. The same way, and I used this illustration this last week, the same way that he can use weights in a weight room. That's a weight. I don't know if you've ever studied the word weight. You know, it's something, if you get a weight put on your shoulders, it's heavy. And it's not comfortable. However, how you respond to that weight defines if it's helpful to you or harmful to you. It could, you know, you could twist a muscle in your back, pull something. You could have all sorts of problems if you don't handle that weight well. But if you handle it well, I mean, you could do some squats with it. You could take it, do some curls with it. You could do some uh, presses with it. You could get muscle out of this thing. The same is true with the path of Jesus. If you embrace it, it strengthens you. You can smile at it. You can rejoice when you face trials of many kind. You can count them pure joy because these very trials are what are building spiritual strength in you. 
So though we may be of highest birth, of the most royal pedigree, of the finest education, of the greatest talent, of the wealthiest class, and have been groomed for earthly greatness, boy, does that sound like us? Not really, but even if it did, we are to follow Jesus. So even if that was our pedigree, even if we were some of the most famous people on earth, the wealthiest, well, guess what? There's still only one entrance into the kingdom of heaven. You want to be crowned with a heavenly crown? You're going to have to give up your earthly one. We are to follow Jesus and make ourselves of no reputation and take upon ourselves the form of a servant, humble ourselves and become obedient unto death, even the most horrible, cruel, humiliating, and shameful death of a cross. Jonathan and Saul, you have two. Saul didn't want to give up his throne. He was a little like Napoleon, just a lot taller version. And then we have Jonathan. He was the heir apparent to Saul's throne, and yet he is going to sponsor David's throne. Uh, that's a crazy thing to do. Jonathan, you do realize you're going to lose your throne then. But he's going to establish the better man. The same thing for us. You can keep your throne. You already have it when you're born. You're sitting on it. My life. This is my body. My future. And Jesus says, if you really want that to work, you need to get off that throne. You need to step down and give it to me. And that's when life works. The coronation of the saints, the great spittle smearing celebration. By the way, if you don't know what spittle is, it's spit. Yeah, very pleasant. That's why I'm calling it spittle. It's a little less uh, ugly of a word. I don't know if that's true, but. <clears throat> Second Timothy 2, 11 through 12. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. I'm going to read it again, guys, because I'm not sure if you caught it. But this is a summary of everything I've said. It is a faithful saying, says Paul, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. We must bravely walk the red carpet of Christ's sufferings, the royal path of heavenly coronation, strewn with happy petals of righteous suffering and the joyous trumpet sounds of sweet praises for the great victor. Our pain is the chrism. That's an anointing oil. Our wounds are our ermine robe. The thorns of mockery are crown. The nails of earthly trial are cannonade and benediction. And the spear in our side, the standing ovation of the heavenly dignitaries. The low place. It's not just a seat at a table. In every situation in life, we are built and designed for the low place. I had a message a couple weeks ago called the low spot. Water, according to its function, will always go to the lowest place. And the same is true with the living water that is gushing out of us. Those that believe on me out of their innermost man will flow rivers of living water. Where the, where's that water going to go? It's going to go to the lowest place. So taking the low place in our soul and bodies. So I live in this body. I mean, you have your own, right? I live in this one. You know what? There's a low place in this body and there's a high place in this body. And I could take the seat, the highest seat in this body and say, mine! Mine! Or I could actually take the lowest seat at the table and say, Jesus, this is yours. One works and one doesn't. And if I take the lowest seat in my own body, I know that sounds strange, but even in my own mind, you know, one of the key moments in my life was when I realized that Jesus is smarter than me, that the word of God is actually more intelligent than me. I was a pretty smart guy back in the day and I had it all figured out. And I was looking at Jesus's word. And I'm like, well, I mean, I don't know. And it was a huge moment in my life when I said, okay, you're the creator of the heavens and the earth. I think you know what you're talking about. And I took the low seat at the intellectual table in my own mind. And I said, God, I trust your word. I believe you are the intellect of intellects. Taking the low place in our families. I mean, you could be a big, you know, dude in your family. You could be the, you know, the, the top dog in your family. And yet, how do we approach our family? There's a table. Let's take the low seat. And it does not mean that you are relegating your role. If you're a father, you're still the father, right? But you can take a low position of servanthood instead of, hey, guys, everyone serve me. Take the low place in our marriages. Take the low place in our friendships. Take the low place in our work situations. Take the low place in our churches. Take the low place in our ministries. Take the low place in our obedience. Take the low place in our futures. Spurning the coronation of Napoleon. Final slide, guys. Don't let the despicable little five foot two Napoleon inside you get his grubby hands on the crown. He's certainly not about, about to stick it where it rightfully belongs. So we are told to deny little five foot two Napoleon inside of us. 
We are told to put to flesh the deeds of little five foot two Napoleon inside of our life. We're supposed to be set free at the cross from his power, from his chicanery, from his mischievous behavior so that we can live for Jesus. No longer after the flesh or after Napoleon and his instincts, but after the spirit of God. And that's the great triumph and the great picture of what we as the church of Jesus Christ are privileged to showcase on this earth. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this retro message to bring back remembrance of your highness, but also your lowness, that one so high would come so low. Lord, it's staggering and it's hard for us to comprehend. But I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give us a greater understanding of what you have done for us, that we would see it with more clarity and that we would respond to it with more vigor. Spirit of God, move within us. Have your way in your church. It's in the precious name we pray. Amen.